thank you for this this opportunity to to speak and you use me lord and i just pray that you that i can walk in the spirit and you and you can use me lord on the street not in here we don't have to be on the mountain we don't have to be in jerusalem to worship the real worship is in spirit and in truth in our hearts dear god and with you lord i love you and i praise you in jesus name amen amen Good morning, how y'all doing? Morning. Morning. Y'all kind of sleepy this morning, that's what it sounds like. Y'all want to stand up this morning? We are going to worship our Jesus this morning.
us. It does. Brian suffered loss here a month ago. Very difficult loss. Him and his whole family lost his dad. It has influenced his life for the last month or so and still, guys, it's going to be a little ways on down the road. Illness. We go through illnesses and they influence our lives and they influence the sphere of people that surround us and in turn influences them and us as well. If you talk to the world out there, they, they, they tend to think that everything is relative. Well, I don't know that it's all what you call relative or it's just stuff. My dad summed it up in one four-letter word he called his life, so I'll get, get over it. It's life. It's how life is. Life is up and down. Right. I remember spheres of influence. I remember back in elementary school, when this kid came to school wearing these big, wearing these jeans, and I thought they were the coolest thing. They had bell bottoms. Right. <laughs> Y'all remember? And then all of the rock and roll bands began to have fros, wear vests, beads, and bell bottoms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we were cool. So we got bell bottoms. We also got Coca Cola pants. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. Now, my last day and age, they didn't really have very, very much. They didn't have them. They had parachute pants, okay? They were cool. They had, they had parachute pants, you know. They didn't have no design. Of course, we had tie-dye, too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's funny how things influence. Today, guys, I, I want to talk to... Uh, God wants to talk to all of us about influence. I heard a guy at work the other day said, I don't want nothing to do with Christianity, Brother Scotty, because you said cuss words in front of me. Ooh. Well, guess what? Guilty. Guilty. I've lost it, guys. There's been times at my work where I wanted to just literally line every one of them men up over and beat their heads in with a, with a stick. I said, God, plumb up. I got something. You act like a bunch of junior high teenagers. The drama. Never seen anything like it. They're not men. They're boys. It's aggravating. <coughs> Literally. They still talk about high school things. They're 50 years old. <laughs> How do they even remember high school? <laughs> you know, I, I bowed down to prayer and said, God, forgive me. I did. Man, I did. But you know, you know what God told me? He said, guess what, Scotty? What was Moses? He said he was a great leader of your people, Father. Now before that. He said, now before that, he was a murderer. What was David? David was a king. David was the one that slew the lie. Did you know he was also an adulterer and a murderer? He said, the problem that you're having, Scotty, is you're allowing people to influence you and get you, pull you down, pull you away from what I'm calling you to do. Amen. That's right. You're letting people, you're letting words you're letting things. Let me tell you, let me explain something to you, hon. Hon? Sounds good, don't it? Hon? Honey, hon. If your Christianity is dependent upon the conduct 
of someone else, you're going to go to hell. You're going to bust hell wide open because none of us are perfect. It's not what you know. It's who you know. And guess what? If you think you're going to live sinless, if you think you're not going to mess up, brother, you're in for another, another run. Because you can't resist. Some people just set themselves up for jokes. That was supposed to be funny. Come on here, guys. Wake up. Literally. Sometimes we're just we're just not thinking. Sometimes our influence has us thinking on other things. And we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So my question to you today is, brother and sister in Christ, are you really are you really, truly mounting your non-belief in God based upon the conduct of others? Because if you are, you're lost. Moses was a murderer. David, an adulterer. A murderer. Rahab the harlot <coughs> was a harlot. In Jesus' day it was terribly frowned upon. Yet every single one of them right now are in the kingdom of God. <coughs> so guys, what is this? Where does that lead us? You know, here we are. We're, we're, we're paying attention to rules. We're paying attention to the, the thou shalt not. It's kind of easy, or it's kind of uh, hard to see, but how does Satan pull us back into the church of better not and the church of better do? In Mark chapter 3, let's go there. Mark chapter 3. I don't want too far. Mark chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. Guys, the, the, the Scripture uses the word withered here. I don't know what your notes say in your, in your Bible. Uh, you're probably going to have many different definitions of withered. But obviously, it was a situation where this man needed healing. A hand is, is a, a very difficult thing to do without when you're a working man. I remember a, a, a story told when I was young. My dad, uh, my dad told it, and uh, he said it was passed down to him. For his dad passed away when he was two, and he said after the papa passed away. They needed someone to hook up the horse so they could they could plow the field and they could get it broke up to grow their crop. Back then, Daddy said we we grew everything we ate. We had hogs. We did we did everything. He said I learned to count to count to a hundred, but by counting the chickens to the floor. He said that's no lie. My, my, my uncle's actually backed that up. He was very very he grew up very simple, very poor. But he said. We had this real bad horse that, that after you got a bridle on him, you could work him, but till you got the bridle on him, he was the meanest thing that ever walked in the barn. And so they took my Aunt Babe into putting Papa's coat on and Papa's hat on and going out there and, and staying hungered over and trying to get the bridle on the horse to get him ready to plow. Well, everything was working really, really good. She just about had the bridle over the ears of the horse, and then my Uncle Colt thought it would be funny to reach up and pull the hat off her head from the next little stall over. In which case, the horse nearly ate her alive before she could get out of there. 
My uncle Coke said that's the worst whipping he ever got from anybody, man or woman. My aunt babe nearly killed it. <laughs> and so they thought of another idea. They would go down the road and there was a, a younger man down there named J.H. Wright. J.H. and Beulah lived right down below the hill. And I knew J.H. Wright. Very sweet man. He worked at the sawmill across the street. So they called J.H. They so went down to get J.H. and asked him if he would come and he would help him pitch the horse. They said, J.H. said, sure, I'll be down there, no problem. So he walked into the barn and he walked to the stall where the horse was at and he reached up and he put his hand over the top of the gate to walk into the stall and the horse kicked and just literally laid his hands and fingers open with the bottom of his feet. And, and J.H. just put his hand back in his pocket and walked home. Now my aunts and my uncles told me that they as a family had prayer for J.H. that night because he worked at the mill. And the hands were a huge part of his success. Times were tough, and he had to be able to go to work. Hands, withered hands. They're, they're, guys, I want, to, I want to tell you, back in the days of these, uh, of these times, right here, hands meant everything to you. You couldn't hardly do anything without them. If you lost one, it was a very difficult road. So here we are in the synagogue, and Jesus Christ sees a man with a withered hand. Verse 2, and they washed him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto them, unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. He said, stand up. Hey, stand up here, bro. Right in the middle here. And then he turns around and he says, he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they didn't answer. They held their peace. When he had looked around on them with anger, notice his countenance, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the others. Father, we come to you today, and we pray about this message, Lord God. Father, let us understand, let us comprehend what we need to know. Father, anoint it inside our hearts, anoint it inside our minds, our souls. Father, let us, let us be what we're called to be. Fill us with your love, your spirit, your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have it. We have the truth about Jesus Christ and what He was truly all about when He walked the face of our planet. You see, much like our situation today, their situation had fell into an, an area of pure religion, pure law, pure rule. And Christ came to break that ruling and literally set every, everything religious on its nose and take it back to the place that it should have been all along. And that's about His people. It's about His people. Guys, when we, when we look at this situation, we realize that Jesus Christ knew for a fact I am going to be enemy of the state number one when I do this. This is going to get ugly. Now I've got to decide what I want to do, what, what God wants me to do, what Dad wants me to do here. Do I need to go ahead and do what I know I'm supposed to do or 
do I play it safe? And he lived somewhere else. He lived somewhere else. He could have done that. Jesus Christ could have spoke the word when he walked out. And no nothing, no harm would have came. No harm, no foul. But he didn't. There was a correction that needed to be made. And Jesus Christ was willing to go to the mat and make it before his father and everybody there. It's not about your rules. It's not about your regulations. It's about my people. And guys, we're falling back into the same thing. Slowly but surely, churches today in this area, this area, are falling back into the same thing. And we're worried because we're going to get accused of not being what we're supposed to be. Guess what? Don't worry about those. Don't worry about those people. You know, I kind of looked at it the other day and I thought, well, for first paying attention to me, that God's going to make me say, He's going to let this big mouth say something. And they're not going to like it. Oh, that hurts. Literally, God's people watch us. They do. Especially if you're a Christian. Most of them watch to see if you're going to get in that good parking spot in front of Walmart. He's a Christian. He should have let me have that spot. <laughs> I saw something the other day that, that, that I, was, I thought was so funny. I had to share it with Vicky. This guy posted on Facebook. He said, he said, yeah, Black Friday, my favorite time of the year. He said, I go to all these crowded parking lots and I get a good parking spot and I just sit there with my backup lights on. <laughs> You and y'all are gonna get there. I mean, that, that's, that, that is really that's, that's really hurting me. That's nasty. That's bad. <laughs> because literally, are we still about our father's business? Jesus Christ was willing to break the rules to bring healing. He was willing to break the rules. 1 Corinthians talks about Paul said, he said, you know, uh, when uh, I became all things to all men. To the Jew I became as a Jew. To the Greek I became as a, G, a, a Greek. To the one without the law, I became as one without the law. But listen, I didn't break the law of Christ. I didn't break the law of God. What is he saying? He's saying this, listen. He's breaking status quo here. He's not, he's not sinning against the Father. Do we get this? He's breaking regulations that have no bearing on his eternal significance. They don't have any. They have no bearing. What do you think that God's thinking with a hand? Ooh, thank you. What do you think he's thinking? <coughs> I'm telling you, if I'm sitting in this synagogue and Jesus Christ tells me to stand up in the midst, if somebody says he better not heal me, I'm, the, this, this other man thinks to come right across his face. <laughs> what? Shut up! I'm ready for this hand to get healed. Can y'all not get this? Yeah, amen. Literally, if I'm in this man's sick, if I'm in his shoes, if my hand is withered, I don't care where it's at. I don't care if it's at Walmart. I don't care if it's right here in this floor. If you've got a situation going on in your life, it's very important to you. You don't care where it happens. You just pray in Jesus' name that it happens. Amen. That's what you're doing. And Christ knew it. Guys, here we are in our Christmas season. Man, we're, we're supposed to be celebrating Jesus Christ. Everybody's fighting tooth and nail. It's all about the gifts. It's all about the gifts. It's all about the sales. It's all about this and that. And 
we're missing the whole point of the whole season. We're missing the whole point of Jesus. Because all we can see is this world. We can't go beyond. We literally can't. We won't allow ourselves. We're going to do our best to stay within the status quo. We're going to worry about what our neighbors got, what we didn't get. We're going to worry about how much money we spent. I am always worried about that. Why? No status quo. I got a question. How many of you know and realize that Jesus Christ was not born on December the 25th? He wasn't. I believe he was born in the summer, which is our April. That's when I believe he was born. I don't know. That's springtime. I got to do more study. You see, brother and sister of Christ, here's, here's the problem with us today. Everybody else, our sphere of influence, it's all over us, and everything coming at us influences us, and we react to those influences, and we totally lose our path, our path we totally lose our, our whole mindset with God. We're not willing to stand our ground when someone literally comes down and says, oh man, you're not a Christian. Oh yeah, I am. No, you're not. You said a dirty word. Yeah, I said it to you. <laughs> Shouldn't have. Literally, guys, you're just as human as the next guy. You're just as human as the next guy. Most of us will go crawl in a hole or we'll quit doing what we're doing because we're not worthy. Oh, we said a dirty word. We said this and that. And man, we'll clam up and we'll, we will, we will lose our sphere of influence on people. You know, it's awful funny though. That very same person that told you that when something goes on in their house, will you come pray for my mom? Yeah. Guys, God's telling us not to quit. We got some people out today that's on that's on vacation. Some people had to go out of town. When we're going to start reaching back out. When we're going to go out and gather up on a Monday night again. We're going to start visitation again. Go out. Hey, we're from the church at Benton. Here, before you slam the door in my face, here, I want you to give you this card. <laughs> go ahead and slam the door. I'm going to slide it underneath. <laughs> But do you know how many people, especially this time of year, are going to open their door and they're going to prayer? <coughs> no doubt there, there's going to be some. Oh, does your church buy gifts? You're going to get that every year. You're going to find somebody that. They're going to have a Cadillac sitting in their front yard. They're going to have a cigarette hanging out of the side of their mouth. And they're going to be dressed in, in, in whatever kind of thing. But they want the church to buy the gifts for their kids. We're going to see that every year. 
What do you do with those people? You pray for them. You literally pray for them. God, I, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I've been going, I've been, I, I've been on study of prophecy. I mean, have any of y'all seen this, this, this on Facebook? The United Nations calls for one world government in less than 12 years. Huh? It's coming. How many of y'all seen that on Facebook? I don't know who I'm friends with that posts that. Probably Paul Carter. You know Paul Carter? Yeah. United Nations, European Union, all these things call for one world government in less than 12 years. Now, how many of us really study and understand how significant that is? This book, written over 2,000 years ago, tells everybody that this is going to happen and nobody believes it. Right. Right. Nobody believes it. Nobody believes that Israel is going to become a nation again. Nobody believes it. 1948, Balfour Declaration of a Nation. 1967, the Six Day War. They take back Jerusalem, their home, their, their capital city, where the throne of David resides. Never going to happen. Outnumbered 20 to 1. And it happened. <coughs> Not going to happen. Okay, here's another one. Turkey and Russia going to be going to be allies. Never going to happen. Well, now the ruler of Turkey, the, 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 the prime minister of Turkey is Islam. He's a Muslim. And him and old Vladdy's really buddying up. But it was never gonna happen. Psalms 83. Some of you have never heard, you, you don't even study about the end times and you don't understand the Psalms 83 war because you don't care. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, we could go home and Jesus Christ could return within the hour. Amen. Right. Amen. Everything. Amen. Every prophecy that he said would happen 2,500 years ago has literally led it right in front of our face and we're looking the other way. We're worried about how we're acting. And we're worried we might offend somebody. And Jesus is telling you in John in Mark chapter 3, get offensive. Offend somebody. Break status quo. Because that person's going to go to hell if they don't get it right. Literally. Biblical prophecy. Romans chapter 1, we don't even have to go there. What's another? Vladimir Putin has dumped millions into Iran. Iran has enriched uranium enough now to make nuclear warheads. And you know what their battle cry is? Death to the West. Death to the America. And you know who gave it to them? John Kerry. Barack Obama. Gave them enriched Uranium. Guys, it's time to quit worrying about what other people think and start getting in faces about do you believe 
in Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Because it's just going to keep getting uglier. Literally. Continue to keep getting uglier. I mean, here's the thing. Let's just let's just let's just put it like this. When God called us out of the church that we were in to come here, we didn't we didn't necessarily set out to start another church that was status quo. That's not what it was about. We fell on our face before God and we said, God, what is it that everybody else is leaving behind that we're missing to? What is it that we're doing that's hindering everybody from coming in to hear God's Word? So we fell on our face. God, what do we need to do? This is your church. This is not ours. We're your servants. You're not ours. What do we need to do? And this is what he came up with. We start, it's got 92 people the very first Sunday. You can't find an empty chair in this house. Slowly but surely, we're falling off. Because we're getting comfortable. Right? It's not as important. It's not as important anymore. We do have the antidote to the problem. And it's Jesus Christ. But we're comfortable. We're becoming status quo. Excited? Larry, yeah. well, you, you, know you know what to do. Excited? Yeah. See guys, here's the thing. We're going, we're going to have to, we're going to let, have to let our sphere of influence not be what's going on around us and let the sphere of influence be what's above us. And literally, literally set our mind to picking out one person a day that we talk to Jesus Christ about. One person. One name. Get up in the morning, pray for the name. Pray for the name. Pray that he gets set free from that. Can y'all witness that? Mm -hmm. Guys, let me tell you something. What's going on here is what God had in mind. And he is Satan is literally doing everything he can do to stop it. And we're letting him. This place should have doubled in size. Should have doubled in size. We've been here a year and a half. We should have five campuses right now with what God can do. It's my fault. Here's the, here, here's, here's the real question. God's going to bring it back around and this is, this is painful. Right now, y'all think I've been babbling. Uh-uh. God knew what he was talking about with the withered hand. What if you're the one lost? What if 
if you're the one lost. Number one, nothing changes. You're stuck and stuck. You don't have the means to get out of status quo. John chapter 3, verse number 17. I didn't come into the world to condemn the world because the world is condemned already. You're stuck in status quo. And you don't know there's anything else out there. This man with withered hands in the synagogue, and he is literally going to the synagogue praying that Jehovah is going to heal his hand. And guess what? Jehovah's messenger shows up one day and says, hey, get up here, man. Uh, uh, no. Come on up. Is it lawful to kill or to heal? Now don't miss this. This man said, oh God, let it be. Let it be. That lost. Like Rick said, well, no, so a lot of y'all didn't catch it. God Himself has set that person that you're supposed to meet up. Psalms 37, the steps of a righteous man are ordered. Ordered. You're supposed to be there. If you're following God, you're supposed to be there. And that person is waiting on the medicine, the antidote that you're the one that's supposed to bring. You're the one that's supposed to bring it. Don't blow it. nights a week. We need to have a few more visitation nights where we go bang on doors. Guys, we're not talking about drumming up members. God's got members here. He's got people here. It ain't about the numbers in the house. It's about the people that we're missing. Look, when, when, when God started this, He said it's kingdom minded. I don't care where they go to church, but if they show up at yours, don't you leave them hungry. Don't you dare leave them hungry. You meet every need they got. We're not doing it. We still need a youth director. We need someone. We haven't been praying enough for a youth director in this house for him to show up. Someone that has the shepherd's heart. That's willing to give his life for the sheep. Hasn't happened yet. Why? <clears throat> God, 
Guys, I'm teaching kids on Wednesday night and I feel like I'm way above them. And I don't know how to play games. I'm too old to get the floor and wrestle. They pin me. I mean, what can I say? They know how to play better now. They There's needs in this house. We're not addressing them. Literally. We're not addressing them. Everything seems like it's just falling by the wayside. <laughs> and chaos is hid. Anybody else get that in their heart, in their spirit? That's what God keeps telling me, Scotty. You danced around it all you can do. You might just come right out and jump. You're going to just quit praying about it and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to preach it. Amen. You've seen it. You've seen it coming for quite a while. This praise thing right here, do y'all realize how good these people are? I'm a, I, look, they got me in the back for a reason. I'm not that good. Amen. But do you realize how good they are? You know what they need? You know where they need to be? In front of as many people as you can put them in front of. The whole church needs to be behind it. If you ain't singing on stage, you can be praying out front. Which one's more important? Neither are the same. Guys, we're, 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 we're blowing it. That's what we're doing. We're blowing our opportunity. And the withered hand is still withered. Status quo is still status quo. And we're all worried about how somebody else thinks of us. No. I refuse. I refuse today to be that way. I have come too far with my God to, to, to stop and become that again. I'm not going there. Kaylin, y'all come up. Y'all look ready to say. Terry, would you turn the lights out? Guys, today, listen. You want me to pray when you come get me. But I'll be honest. I need to pray myself. I need to repent myself for how I've, I've led this church and allowed it to happen to come to here. Because God literally, God has told me this for a while and I've been dancing around and praying hoping hope things will get better. <coughs> this is my fault. But I'm going to ask you on a personal basis, Do you need to be up here with me? Or do you need to be sitting back there? Leave a withered hand. 
Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we come to you. Today I'm guilty. I'm guilty of coasting a little bit, Father. I was tired. I have to admit I was tired. But I coasted and it got comfortable. And it coasted too long. Father, I, I come to you today, Lord, and I pray your forgiveness over my heart, over my life. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, as I open up your word, I pray that your life just leaps off the page and hits me in the face and engulfs my life. I pray in Jesus' name that I am challenged. I am challenged literally to write music that will encourage others and bring healing to your people. Father, in Jesus' name, I, I pray that I am, I am literally challenged, Father God, to get to the deepest, deepest depths of your word. natural man that's to ask him that you answer through me. Father, today I pray about opportunity. I pray in Jesus' name about opportunity. I pray that there's never a, a withered hand. I pray that there's never a broken heart. I pray that there's a, never a broken spirit that enters into this house that leaves the same way that they came in. I pray in Jesus' name that they find healing and restoration in this house. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, I pray that we, we renew our challenge. That we renew we renew our, 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 our vow to be everything that we're called to be before you. Father, in Jesus' name. Today I pray.
But that's the sick one to be December 14th, and we're getting a sign-up sheet to determine how many people or where we need to have it at, either my house or Terrace or the church. So my house or Terrace house. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's it. Anybody have anything else? I think that's it. Uh, out of my prayer. God, I come to you today. I just thank you for for this day. I thank you for for this service, Father. For for just having time to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, and just to listen to your word, what you have for us, and challenging us, Father, to get back to work, to uh, to listen to you, to follow you, to have us do what you want us to do, Father, just to challenge us to be more like you and. And just keep on moving forward in our relationships with you and, and doing exactly what you'd have us to do, Father. God, I pray that we accept that challenge and we take that challenge with us, Father, and we just uh, honor and glorify you in every way this week. In your sister, I pray. Amen.